When the mirror clouds. Prompt, Jay pulled at the mirror. Jay Mason hated his reflection. And it wasn't just his reflection, he hated all of them. Ever since he was a kid, for as long as he could remember, he'd been afraid of them. When he was six years old, he'd been riding high on his father's shoulders when he caught sight of the passenger side mirror of a passing car and tried so hard to get away from it that he tumbled to the floor and broke his collarbone. But he knew better than to scream for his mother. His father didn't like that, not one little bit. Cut it out, his father would say. Stop being such a baby. Truth was, at six years old, he was still a baby. He sucked his thumb, wet his bed, and would have pressed his face to his mother's breast if she was still around. But she wasn't. Jay's mother had disappeared not long after he learned to walk. She hadn't walked out on him, she hadn't died, and she hadn't even gone missing. She had just fallen off the face of the earth. His father, distrustful of the police to begin with, had waited a couple of weeks before reporting it, a fact that the prosecutors had gleefully latched onto, but with no evidence and no body, they'd been unable to press charges. That hadn't stopped the neighbours from arriving at their own conclusions, though. Jay's father was a murderer in their eyes, if not in the eyes of the law. It was around that time that the weirdness set in. The old man became a recluse, too proud to move away but too tired to go outside and risk the scorn of the rest of the neighbourhood. He worked from home whenever he could. When he had to go into the office, he kept his head down and tried to avoid his colleagues. Then the house began to change. Jay's father insisted on keeping the curtains closed at all times and grew out the hedges so they blocked the view of the yard. He only used the back door and covered all the mirrors in the house with bed sheets and towels, eventually upgrading to curtains which could be open and closed to suit him. In the end, he learned to shave by feel alone, and the curtains remained closed and collected dust, oil and bacteria. The weirdness followed Jay to university. His housemates discovered the foible and started surprising him by jumping out with pocket mirrors whenever he least expected it. That all came to an end after someone pushed him too far by planting a large freestanding mirror in front of his door. When Jay opened it up, he put his fist straight through it, ending up in the emergency room with nine stitches. After that, everyone knew about the weirdness, but nobody mentioned it. He'd graduated six years earlier and now worked as a counsellor, although he called himself a therapist, in a bustling commuter town. He lived in a masonette with only one mirror to worry about. He was running late to work again. Jay couldn't drive because he couldn't look in the rearview mirror, and the buses were never on time. Unfortunately, the buses were also all he could afford. His patient was waiting for him when he arrived, a middle-aged man with self-confidence issues and an unfair dose of Asperger's. He was followed by a high-strung businesswoman with a nervous tick and a shopping addiction, and then an ex-junkie who successfully kicked the habit but still needed to deal with the issues that caused it. The next patient was a no-show, so Jay ate his lunch and caught up with some paperwork. In the afternoon, he had sessions with a couple more patients and a catch-up meeting with his supervisor. Then he hopped on the bus again and buried his face in a book so he didn't have to deal with the mirrors in the furniture shops on the high street. That evening, after a disappointing dinner and a bad horror film which lived up to its lacklustre reviews, Jay went for a shower. The hot water filled the room with steam, which was lucky. He noticed what was wrong as soon as he stepped out of the cubicle, before he had a chance to wrap himself in a towel. The curtains around the mirror had opened, seemingly of their own accord. He knew they'd been closed when he entered the room, but now they were hanging apart like two corpses in the breeze. They were moving, dancing, and Jay could hear a rustling susurrus, whispers from another world. The mirror was steamed over, dull enough for Jay to face his fear and to take a closer look. Something was beginning to form there, little shadows taking shape. Jay shuddered and pulled the curtains back across. He slept badly that night, nauseated by childhood dreams and memories, nightmares about mirrors and reflections. He thought about calling in sick and decided against it. But he was sent home anyway after a complaint from one of his patients. Dr Mortimer, Jay's boss and the head of the facility, called him into his office for a quick chat. Sit down, please, he instructed, and Jay obeyed the order. This won't take long. Dr Mortimer sat down heavily on the other side of the mahogany desk and pinched the bridge of his nose. OK, he said, I'll try to keep this brief. Now, as you know, we strive to reach the highest standards of excellence here at Sunnyvale. Because of that, we only hire the very best and we expect our staff to have their heads in the game at all times. I think you know where this is going, Jay. Jay shrugged and said, does it have something to do with Miss Robotham? It has everything to do with Miss Robotham, Dr Mortimer replied. She made a complaint after your session. What did she say? Jay asked. She said she felt like the roles had reversed and that you barely let her get a word in. Something about mirrors and reflections. She used the word obsession and said that you attacked her. Is that true? I wouldn't say that, Jay protested. If anything, she attacked me. She pulled out a compact and I knocked it out of her hands. Dr Mortimer sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose again. It had been a long, long day. Listen, Jay, I appreciate you being honest with me and so I'm going to offer the same courtesy. 
The bottom line is this. This whole mirror thing is getting out of hand. I think you should take a little time off and try to get your head straight. Just a couple of weeks to begin with. And perhaps you should seek some professional help yourself. Jay nodded meekly and agreed to seek help. He thought about the weirdness. He thought about it long and hard and he shuddered. Dr Mortimer dismissed him brusquely as his telephone rang and he reached across the desk to answer it. That evening, Jay heard whispers from the mirror again, although this time the curtain stayed shut. The voices were quiet at first, just at the edge of his hearing, but without really seeming to, they started to grow louder and more intense until he could hear different timbres and tonalities. He could hear men and women, children and adults, a distant barking and meowing. He thought he heard his own name, but he wasn't sure. He even thought he heard a scream, or maybe it was the distant whistle of a far-off train. Whatever it was, he didn't like it, so he skipped his shower and used a coin to lock the door from the outside. He didn't get much sleep. He had nightmares about glass and polished metal, bad dreams about mirrors and fevers, and when he climbed out of bed to use the bathroom, the curtains were hanging wide open. Jay reached behind the mirror and tried to take it down, but the damn thing wouldn't budge. He caught a glimpse of his purple face and the bulging tendons in his wrists and upper arms as he yanked at it, and then he screamed and instinctively lashed out, slamming his fist into the shiny surface and spreading a cobweb of cracks across it. A couple of glittering shards embedded themselves into his knuckles, drawing droplets of blood and sending his stomach lurching. He dragged the curtains back across the mirror and fled the bathroom in terror, then spent the rest of the day pulling glass from his knuckles with a pair of tweezers. That night, he worried himself to sleep with old superstitions of seven years' bad luck. He slept badly, but he managed to grab a couple of hours and woke up feeling strangely zen-like and refreshed. Over his first cup of coffee, he resolved to deal with the weirdness once and for all. Jay made himself a spot of breakfast and then headed into the bathroom. He could hear the whispers again, louder and more clearly than before, but the curtains remained mercifully closed. He took a deep breath and opened them, then gasped. The broken surface had repaired itself with not a crack to show it had ever been damaged. Jay shook his head slowly and checked his knuckles. They were still battered, bruised and a little bloody, quite clearly showing the signs of the day before. If it wasn't for that, he might have thought he was going crazy. Jay set his fear aside to take a closer look at the mirror. It seemed to swirl with subtle shadows, dancing slowly on top of his ashen-faced reflection. He saw shapes and letters, blurred faces from the past registering dimly like spots of light from staring at the sun for too long. The whispers intensified into a chorus of voices, all chanting his name. Then the voices converged into one, cycling through pitches and accents until they settled on the single voice of someone he could barely remember. Hello, son, Jay's mother said. Long time no speak. Mother, he whispered, is that really you? It had been so long since Jay had heard her voice, even in a home video, that he couldn't be sure. But the bond between mother and son was a hard bond to break. Jay somehow knew it was her, and he put his fear on hold like a violinist who spots a break in the score and lays his bow down to wipe a bead of sweat from his forehead. It's really me, the voice said, but I don't have much time. I need you to listen carefully. In two days' time, when the mirror clears, I'll be back again. Promise me that you'll wait for me. What do you mean? Jay asked. I don't understand. Promise me! I promise, Jay said, but please, mother, tell me what's going on. There was no response. As the voices died away, Jay felt the familiar sting of his revulsion. He drew the curtain across the mirror and left the room. For the rest of that day and for much of the next, Jay went from fear to despair and back to fear again. Even his first appointment with the counsellor, Dr Mortimer had freed up his schedule and agreed to meet with Jay himself, did little to ease his anxiety. If anything, it made it worse. In the evening, Jay braved the bathroom. The whispers had quietened down to a low hum, and the curtain was drawn haphazardly across, just how he'd left it. Mum? Jay whispered, tentatively. But there was no response, not even when he tried again with a little more authority. He hesitated for a second and then jerked the curtains open. The mirror had clouded over, but the shadowy figures were closer to the surface than ever before. Jay stared in wonder for a couple of seconds, then shuddered and turned away again. He slept soundly that evening without a single one of the night terrors that he'd grown so used to. But when he woke up, he was filled with a stomach-churning blend of excitement, apprehension and anxiety. He didn't eat and he didn't drink. He waited. There was something in the air, some sort of palpable electric energy. He found himself resisting the urge to check the mirror, filled with the knowledge that when the time was right he'd know it. The seconds dragged slowly by, turning into minutes and hours with a dull, inevitable certainty. At five minutes to midnight, he was ready. It was time. Jay could hear the mirror's fevered murmurings from out in the hallway, but as soon as he opened the bathroom door, a sudden silence descended. For a brief, crazy moment, Jay wondered whether this was what vultures heard as they pillaged corpses after a battle. He was scared like a survivor, but he swallowed his fear, gathered his resolve and walked inside, then locked the door behind him. 
He drew open the curtains, bracing himself for the reflection, but it still took him by surprise. He saw his own eyes, his own nose, and something of his own jawline, but the similarities ended there. It was enough. Jay had seen the old family photographs, and his mother hadn't aged a day since her disappearance. My son, she whispered. The mirror was like a window with another bathroom on the other side. It's time. What do you mean, mother? Jay asked. He stepped a little closer to the mirror. He could feel a gentle breeze, a wind from another world. I don't understand. Hush, child, be patient. You'll have your answer soon enough. She reached forwards, slowly but confidently, and laid the palm of her hand against the surface. Jay hesitated and thought about pulling back, but it was far too late for that. It was time to face his fear or die trying. When he pressed his hands against his mother's, he felt her warmth as it surged through the glass and into his fingertips. He'd always thought of mirrors as cold, emotionless things, but this one was full of life and love. He smiled and closed his eyes, and then the horror began. He felt an ice-cold hand around his wrist, and his eyes shot open while his mouth flashed in a silent O, a muted scream of surprise. His mother's eyes had changed, and the love had been replaced by a steely determination. Her hand had gone from warm and clammy to cold and dry, and her upper arm was sticking out of the mirror like the unholy appendage of a monster at the bottom of the sea. She reached out with her other hand, and Jay watched as it burst through the mirror and grabbed hold of him. She yanked with superhuman strength, like a pneumatic piston firing on all cylinders, and Jay was falling, falling, falling into the mirror and through to the other side. Back in the real world, in the empty bathroom, the curtains drew closed of their own accord. Six days later, when Dr Mortimer called the police after Jay failed to make his appointment or to answer his mobile phone, the door to the bathroom was kicked open by the heavy boot of a first responder. They were expecting a body, but there was nothing, just a distant whisper and a misty mirror. Sergeant Mogford, the cop with the heavy boot, took a closer look and thought he could see two shadows dancing back and forth across his retinas. Find anything? He glanced towards the door and thought about his colleagues, who were combing the apartment for clues. He wondered what they'd say if he'd told them he'd seen shapes and heard voices. The decision was made for him. No, he replied, nothing. After the policemen left the scene to write up their reports, the whispering grew a little louder and the shapes started to solidify. The curtain drew closed of its own accord. The weirdness was only just beginning.